and they had no idea how and that what she'd gone through. So she dropped this bomb to all of them, and uh, including her boss was then in this meeting. And after this, and this was in, during the pandemic when we had a circuit breaker here basically, and after what happened was that the team completely got together. They had the most beautiful open landscape. Even her boss opened up that he had gone through some challenges himself. The team would uh, uh, share when they had issues. Now they have an open door policy. She feel more engaged with the team than ever before. Why? Because she dared to be vulnerable with her team for the first time in her life. Welcome to episode three. Today I have the pleasure to talk to Nick Johnson, who is the co-founder and managing director of one of Asia's premier networking organizations, Executive Global Network. This is a confidential peer group network consisting of more than 600 SEER executives and business owners. He is also a number one international best-selling author with his book Executive Loneliness and he's an Ironman top 1% world athlete. How cool is that? Nick, I'm so excited to have you in the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Very good. Okay, so let's uh, get to know Nick. So tell me about your background, about your story. Well, I was born in Sweden, uh, but back in the 90s, I wanted to improve my English and I moved to Australia to study. <laughs> and actually, since then, I never moved back to Sweden. So you can say that I'm still on the road since then. Um, I uh, later on moved to Asia and I worked the last sort of 16, 17 years in mainly Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia and almost for the last five years in Singapore. And in a short snapshot I worked my way up to general manager positions. But then these days my life is quite different where I'm the founder and more of an entrepreneur running EGN in Singapore. Very good. Okay, so we're gonna, you've been focusing on a topic which I'm, it's so important today, which is executive loneliness. Tell us about what it is and what is the situation today? Well, it's a topic that is close to my heart, perhaps a little bit too close to my heart. I had first-hand experience when I went through, should you say, uh, perhaps a 40 years crisis a few years ago. I uh, went through a divorce, resigned from a job, so I had to learn first-handed uh, what it was to go through loneliness and um, that is uh, what I then experienced that I wasn't alone to go through these feelings and especially in the workplace many times you can feel isolated uh, as a general manager I perhaps didn't integrate well enough with the teams and I isolated myself um, which many do and then I became very lonely so that is uh, what I then explored with the term executive loneliness. And give us some more background. What is this? The, give us some, if you have some stats uh, to tell what is the, this, the, the, the problem today? What is it? Well, as I uh, started then to research more into the topic, I actually did a survey and I did a survey in Singapore of senior executives, especially where I wanted to see how lonely they felt in their roles. And uh, the findings in the first survey in 2019 showed that 30% felt lonely in the jobs. And then we redid this survey during the pandemic in 2020, and then it had doubled. Uh, so that's a quite remarkable change. Mm. And, and then also there was some stats that there's many people, they go through, through this, the, that, but they don't ask for help. Right? That's right. Due to the stigma, uh, so if you are not feeling well and you feel isolated, you naturally think that you're the leader, you're supposed to run this team. So who am I to go and complain about this or explain how I'm feeling? So naturally many people take, keep these feelings inside themselves. They don't take it someone. They're scared that if I tell my boss or my HR, maybe I will not be up for the next promotion. Maybe they start worry about me. And wow. therefore, uh, yeah, so about 75% uh, will naturally yeah, keep it for themselves. Well, so, so you experienced and you, you touched a little bit more, but tell us about what, what, what happened with you. I think it was in 2014, 2015, you also went to a difficult moment. If you can uh, share more about that uh, moment. 
Sure, I was then in Indonesia in a quite a big role in a medical company there as a deputy general manager, one of the biggest firms in the field in Indonesia. And uh, yeah, I was doing a good job. I was delivering and everything, but it was a lot of challenges and issues that I went home with in the evening that I didn't discuss with someone. And instead of addressing it head on, either perhaps talking to someone in the company or perhaps mm -hmm. getting a mentor or a coach or someone to support me with it outside of work, I kept it for myself. And it went as far as I couldn't cope with it anymore. And I basically resigned from my job to the shock and surprise of everyone who then said, Nick, well, you're delivering so well. Can we move you to Dubai? Can we move you to US? We will find a role for you because they thought that naturally, well, it's in Jakarta, expats sometimes don't like it. They thought the traffic or something was wrong. But at this stage, it has gone so far. It's been so much on my mind that I actually was, I, I just couldn't think of any solutions anymore because I all kept it internally. So how, and then how did you feel? What happened? Well, what happened then, because I, I felt sick at work, I also brought this home, I felt sick at home. It led to also my divorce. I had been married for 13 years and I didn't really know who I was anymore. I lost the, the feelings about myself, the connection to myself. And with that, if you don't have connection and health internally, you have this big problem to connect with other people. So I pushed everyone who loved me away from me. Wow. And uh, it went as far as I didn't know what was home. And I then was thinking, should I move back to Sweden, where I should probably have gone. My son was there uh, and my wife at the time moved back to Sweden. Uh, but I moved back to Vietnam where I had lived earlier. And I was thinking maybe that's where I should restart my career. So I drifted from job to job and not really finding my feet anywhere. Wow. <laughs> What was the moment that you felt that something was going, something was not right? Uh, how did you notice that something was not right? Well, many things changed in these times. So from going from someone who uh, exercised frequently, who did marathons, who did triathlons, and who was delivering, uh, you know, in sport and at work, I stopped exercising. I stopped caring so much about my diet. And with that, I changed from my habit, changed from exercising after work to perhaps going to the bar and have a drink. So good habits change to bad habits. And when you change the habits from going to the gym or going for a jog with a, your local running club into finding your friends in the bar and have a drink, then naturally you come back to those friends the next night for another drink. And that uh, was the process what happened for me over uh, one or two years there when I changed then not only my habits, but my friends and the people I surrounded with and with that, I was step by step brought down. I gained a lot of weight to the point where I, I didn't exercise almost at all, if I'm looking at 2016. And that was when I really lost my health. Yeah. What was your lowest point? So in 2018, I was so sick that I realized that I, I, I didn't know what I could do. And I lived then in Vietnam and with the medical system there, not being set up perhaps for foreigners and the language barriers. I started to look for psychologists, I started to look for help, but I couldn't really find any help. I asked around, people didn't know it. The concept even of asking for help, that didn't really exist. So I just forgot about it and I just went instead on with my, my life. And uh, uh, it went so bad that I wanted to change. And I wanted to move back to where I lived earlier, perhaps Australia, Europe or Singapore because I knew that this is a modern country, help is available, and I was hoping that I could get some support. So that drove me to then uh, getting the uh, move from Vietnam to Singapore with EGN at the time. And uh, in, uh, if I'm looking back in April, May 2018, I reached my lowest point. Um, it, I had then written my will, my testament, because I thought or were pretty sure that life was over. I wasn't suicidal, but you could say that you are almost on a suicide mission when you're abusing alcohol to the way I did it mm -hmm. at the time, or drugs for that matter. Uh, so I realized that I probably don't have much more to go. So I want to clean up everything. I want to make sure that things are right should I leave, which is a tendency of people who actually are suicidal to do these kind of matters. So that's the space I was in. And uh, with that came a complete surrender. Yeah. Wow. Wow, really, thank you for sharing that. And so, so you spoke with many people that went through the same. 
what have you saw as patterns? How people feel, like not just you, but generally, what has been like the, the feelings that people uh, normally feel when they are in that situation? Well, it, it tends to be that they've lost the, the confidence in themselves and mm. the connection in themselves. And I'm interviewing one lady in the book, uh, a lady in the banking industry who worked her way up to managing director. And when I interviewed her the first time, she basically gave me a straightforward interview. She didn't really reveal a lot. But uh, she sent me a message a few days later and said, Nick, can we meet for a coffee? I want to share something more. And when I met her for a coffee, she broke out in tears right away and she said, there's something I need to tell you. Wow. She said, Nick, I rehearsed my own suicide twice. And then when I asked her you know, to elaborate and we were sitting there and she was explaining what happened to her, she had a small cosmetic surgery in her face after an accident and that made her lose her confidence around her colleagues and made her lose her confidence around her husband at home. So similar to what happened to me, she pushed the colleagues away from her, she pushed the husband at home away from her and here was a lady who was really performing, who having it all together, everyone would think on the outside. And as she pushed people away, she found herself being lonely. And no one wanted to go with her for the lunch break. The staff went by herself. She sat in the office here in Singapore, having her salad by herself in the office and working. And instead focusing on delivering results, delivering results, impressing the bosses, wow. still getting the promotions and still doing well, but feeling lonely. And and that's how far it went for her as well. So a similar pattern and that's what I keep hearing coming back over and over. If the issues are not dealt with, if they're not addressed, if they're not spoken with, if you keep it to yourself, then it can go that far. Well, so also in your book, you, you speak also about vulnerability and how it's impacting negatively many people. What is the issue today in terms of vulnerability with leaders? Well, the issue with vulnerability is exactly this, that you are keeping a, a beautiful profile. We see the LinkedIn profiles with everyone having a good profile, but what is hiding behind that? There's no honesty, there's no truth, there's no authenticity. And when you need to hold it all together, looking so great all the time, and, and when it's not real, that's when things can break down. And let me go back to the lady who I spoke about, about the bank, because she's a great example of how she turned it around and from uh, having been uh, rehearsing her own suicide twice and isolating herself. And after she had shared her story with me, uh, she con because we agreed and she would contact her therapist, she told the therapist what had happened and how she felt. Uh, he engaged the husband who was shocked to hear it, but they discussed it, sold it together. And then what she did at work was even surprising to me. She actually uh, got a copy of my book. She gave it to all her colleagues to read a book and then they had an all hands meeting on a Friday. And uh, she said in this meeting that, by the way, the lady you read about in the book, that's me. And they had no idea how, and that what she'd gone through. So she dropped this bomb to all of them and uh, including her boss was then in this meeting. And after this, and this was in, uh, during the pandemic when we had a circuit breaker here basically, and after what happened was that the team completely got together. They had the most beautiful open landscape. Even her boss opened up that he had gone through some challenges himself. The team would uh, uh, share when they had issues. Now they have an open door policy. She feel more engaged with the team than ever before. Why? Because she dared to be vulnerable with her team for the first time in her life. <laughs> That's an amazing story. But you have also a, um, another story that had an impact on you, uh, uh, it impacted you deeply, that you mentioned in your book, which was what happened with the, your friend, right? Can you tell us about that story and how it impacted you and going maybe to, to dedicate your life to, do, to work on, on this? Yes, so the book is actually dedicated to Simon Graves, who died in suicide in 2019. Sure. He was a senior executive in the HR space here in Singapore, loved by many. And um, he had in 2019 uh, fulfilled a lot of his dreams. He went to Mount Everest uh, where he climbed to the base camp. He was very fit. He had a Facebook page where I followed and I saw his training preparation for this. And he was looking best uh, of his life. He also had a girlfriend he loved and he posted on social media that he'd never been happier. Uh, so here was a man living the, the full life, uh, really exploring everything. 
I had discussed with him and invited him to give a talk to the EGN members on the future of work, which was his space. And we were preparing for this. Everything was going well. Suddenly he was gone and no one could have any understanding why. Uh, my response then was immediately to call up his brother who is in the UK and ask how can I help, how can I make things right and it was everything about cleaning up what was happening here in Singapore then. I did everything I could but then I also asked can I talk officially about what had happened because I want people to learn from this. He said shout it out loud and when he said shout it out loud I wrote a LinkedIn post about my own recovery journey. I was then one year inside my own recovery and I had spoken about it with therapists, doctors and in close anonymous circles but no one on the outside knew that I had gone through these challenges. In fact people thought that I had it all together but I didn't. But this time then because I was in recovery and what happened to Simon I wanted to stand up and I made this post and I set up a fund to raise money for the SOS Samaritans, which is a suicide prevention agency here in Singapore uh, to raise awareness for suicide prevention, but also to raise funds. Mm. And uh, that's how it all started. And I shared this and I made a video um, on LinkedIn and it went viral all over the world. It went like a bomb. And uh, before I knew it, uh, radio stations called me and wanted to hear more about it. I was on a four page full spread in the Business Times, which according to me, and the research I've done is still the biggest media exposure related to mental health and loneliness in the history of Singapore. So this is when I realized I was uh, opening the door to something and that no one had dared to talk about. So that's when I, and then just over a few months, there was 25 media articles. The, all the press in Singapore wanted to hear more and more about this. And that's when I, uh, I realized that I had to write a book about it. Wow. I'm even having goosebumps. What a story. So, so to go a little bit more deeper, where's the disconnect? Like you see, like on, I, I, and I know many people also like that. On, on the outside, it looks like there's a, every, there's a perfect life. Even they, they look like feel good. But on the other side, it looks like there's a disconnect. Where does that come from? It comes from not being vulnerable. It comes from not being oh. sharing uh, with people how you feel internally and talk about feelings and stopping and going deep. Uh, it comes about always chasing the goals and the KPIs. I myself um, have been even to Las Vegas to see Anthony Robbins. I was personally involved in Vietnam to fly in Brian Tracy, uh, uh, Nick, the gentleman no arms, no legs, all these motivational gurus I've been passionate about, read every book about them, followed the audiobook, programmed my brain to set up the KPIs and goal orientation and grab it. Uh, that was my motto at university. I looked at the number two in the class as the first loser and I said, well, you should approach studies and work like you approach sport. If you see the, the final in the, in the World Cup or in the Olympics, the number two is standing there crying. Uh, so why don't we address our studies or our work like that? That was my winning motto. So if you attack life hard like that, you reach the top, but it can be a quite lonely journey. So that is the, uh, the challenges. Uh, and I was just hitting targets and getting the promotions, reaching everything I wanted. Wow. Okay, so, so now let's move. We understood, hmm. the, the, I, think it was, I think it was very clear. You, you, now we understood what is the, the issue, the context and some stories. So now let's move into more about solution. And I'm, I mean, it's so amazing to see your story, how you went from the place where you were, where you are now. So let's start by saying, when was the moment that you really felt something shifted in you in order to start coming into another direction, a more positive direction. What was, remember that moment, what was that moment? Yes, yeah, so if I take you back to 2018 when I had moved to Singapore a few months when I was lying in my bed and I thought life was over and I've written my testament, my will, uh, I decided to then tell my new wife who I just married three weeks earlier um, and I told her how I felt and uh, she started immediately coming to solution mode and together uh, she joined me to see a friend who, uh, who had gone through recovery herself, someone who's been there before. And through that I got some phone numbers, I got some connections, I went to have a doctor's report. I start, joined an anonymous support group um, uh, and to address the issues that I had. 
and then the switch came basically within 24 hours. It was like a, a completely on and off switch and uh, of course I was still very sick, my body was broken yeah. down but I got something and that was hope. I, I got hope by just opening up and by start talking to some people it was very very fast. Wow. So that was the, the beginning, that was the beginning of the journey so that you start building and, and starting connecting with yourself and that made you come here. So, so then, you, you, you st you, then you wrote the book. Um, so maybe you, you, you can tell us about, um, maybe tell us a bit about the book. What is it the book um, about? Well, uh, if we go back to Simon's story there, so it's dedicated to him. So it's really the purpose of the book is to raise awareness about uh, this topic. That it's okay to talk about it. Life is up and down. We all have our good times and bad times. And we need to talk about both. And we need to talk about our feelings with our friends, our colleagues. And it, that is ultimately what it's about. But the, the purpose of the book is also to be a guidebook for people. So perhaps not everyone is as lucky and blessed as me. Uh, to then have managed to find a new wife when you are sick and to tell that person and to that person also help you. And uh, that's when probably it, it, it goes uh, in a, a down south and bad. If people are in this, the shape I was and uh, given up hope on everything and if you don't have someone to talk to how to do it, then uh, uh, that can be a trouble. So my book is also a step-by-step step step approach for people to help them. Very good. So maybe let's now understand your journey, how you the, the full journey, because in your book you, you you talk about there's like five steps that can people when they are in that situation what they can do in order to to, to come out of, of that and to thrive, right? So maybe let's understand what are the the, the, the five steps, right? So the, the first one that you you spoke is about taking stock. Yes. Can you tell us about what it is? Yes, so the first step then taking stock is, and if we look at a shop, if you're a business owner and you're, you're, you're selling items, you normally, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, you have a stock take. You look at the inventory and you look what's there. And I believe that as human beings, we need to do the same. We need to be honest with ourselves, maybe on a piece of paper or a spreadsheet, where we write down the things that are going on in our life and be brutally honest. If we are overweight, if we are abusing alcohol or drugs, so if we are, have a gambling problem, if we have broken relationships with people, we need to write all of that down. And it can be done perhaps by yourself or with a mentor, a coach, or in my case, because I joined a support group, I was given a sponsor, someone who's done it before, who took me through and helped me and held me accountable to put down that sheet. And that was the first time in my life when I've been really brutally honest with myself and done this stock take. Wow. Okay, so that's the, the first one. So then the second, and you said it's about asking for help. Yes, yeah, so once you have that list, it's about looking at where can I take every item here? Who can I ask for this help? In, in my case then, I realized that I need to get a lot of help. So with my fitness, I got a fitness coach to help me. And with diet, I got a nutritionist. And for my relationships and stuff, I, I was working with various experts to address everything head on. So it was about asking for help. And in my book also, I elaborate more about this. There's helplines, there's phone numbers in the book for people to call. Like even like, and what, what is your suggestion for if someone is going through a tough time, asking for help, maybe sometimes it can be hard to ask, I mean, or a coach or like, what is something small that people can do in order to ask for help, who they can start? Well, many times uh, it's just about opening your mouth because once you speak something out, you al already perhaps have the solution yourself. It's when you keep silent and keep it inside that it is the major problem. So it doesn't really matter who it is. Uh, it can be anyone. Uh, there's so many anonymous support groups to join in every city in the world, also in Singapore or anywhere in Asia. Uh, they are in the book, some of them, but otherwise in Google you find them. But there must be someone. Everyone can join those, but if you have a friend, a family member, someone at all who cares, uh, you can always uh, talk to them and just start the process. And so the, the, the third step, it's about getting healthy. Yes, so in, in my case, as I said, my health had gone down. I lost appetite for exercise and diets and all this. And I think if we've gone through a challenging journey and you're in recovery, you've got to 
look after your body and get it back in shape uh, because it's all linked uh, right the, the the body and the feelings and everything so so that is first before you can address external things and so on I believe we need to get that on, on in shape and especially many times people had abused drugs alcohol or anything like that so it's about addressing that so that's what I did I removed uh, the alcohol and got myself uh, really uh, fit again um, and then the next step you speak it's about building the relationships right yes uh, and this is something also I found out when I interviewed people for the book is that what happens because if people have been uh, sick uh, and lonely they've isolated them so they pushed people away and there will be a lot of relationships that are broken uh, with colleagues friends family members there will be people when you have not been in shape to reply to them you have not addressed them so there will be people who are wondering what happened to you there will be people who perhaps don't contact you anymore and you will most likely and I did walk around with negative feelings inside you about these people and let me just give one example here um, so in regards to the list I mentioned on this first step where you wrote the inventory you have written down these kind of relationships where um, were damaged and one of them I broke down, uh, wrote down was with my sister so it was an incident many years earlier when we had a lunch and uh, my son who was only a few years old then was given a coca-cola and I remember I felt very bad about this he had not been drinking sugar drinks by then and I stormed off the lunch table with him and after that I didn't contact my sister for some years we didn't have much contact we just saw each other perhaps at some family reunion but we didn't talk or we didn't communicate so the, here I was walking around feeling bad about this incident for many years without addressing it and as I went through then this step to repair the relationships I asked her out for lunch wow. and uh, I said uh, by the way I'm sorry about the, when I stormed off the table there I didn't mean that and she could not even remember the incident for her this was a long time ago and she had not even noticed it so that just shows you know how much baggage we're walking around with how much pain we're walking around with that the other person don't even know wow what a story yeah. so let's move to the next one mm. which is about finding purpose yeah can so you now you've come as far as you, you hopefully have your body in shape again your exercise your brain is, is functioning you repair the relationships you're walking around a little bit for a year I believe that only at that stage are you fit enough to really look a little bit deeper what is the purpose for you in your life what is it you want to achieve uh, and, and that is what many people are missing and in my case also uh, perhaps too much ego driven too much KPI driven chasing the goals the targets you've stamped on many people's feet you know to achieve your goals and your target and that's how the companies the career paths and are set up we have you know meetings with our HR and they will set up your targets your career and build this path to the top for you uh, so I believe that here we need to really rethink that and is that really in line with what we what makes us happy in my case uh, it wasn't what made me happy it was not what was important in my life and uh, I believe that is something at least for many executives or anyone in a career path we need to have that conversation as well not just one way that it's about getting the promotions getting the pay but also that does it really matter at the end of the day so in my case here it was really identifying what mattered to me and with this I, I, I made a lot of changes in my life yeah I can see so when you look back in this journey what have you learned about yourself well I learned that what matters more than uh, than career and money and fame was really exercising and feeling good and having open and non-broken relationships and uh, I think having broken relationships and going to bed with the feeling that something is not right that is something that was the most important in my life and I wanted to fix that to the point where I also want to help others and I'm now volunteer uh, for the SOS Samaritans nice. but I'm also a volunteer for an anonymous support group here uh, and even tonight and tomorrow morning I will be there to support them with other people who are going through these challenges right now so I want to give back and help them uh, to go through these steps the steps we talked through 
And that is now my purpose because uh, I got a gift. I mean, my life was somehow saved and I managed to go through this and it is not rocket science. It is a few simple steps. We just have to do it. Okay. So, mm. so we are almost coming to the end. Now what comes to my mind? So what is the world that you want to see like for your son, for the future and the world that you are working towards? Well, it's certainly a more open environment, more friendly environment where less elbowing, let's, uh, let's instead together, you know, work and understand each other's strengths, the weaknesses and yeah, more harmony. I think we need more harmony uh, at work, but also with our, our family and partners. And that's what I'm working towards. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. So now the, the, the final question. Is, so we talk about performance, um, about high performance, and leaders, they're going to go into uh, there's gonna be the, the next few years, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And I would like to ask you, I'm going to take you 10 years ahead, what is, what is something that leaders need to do, start doing now that will help them in the future, but maybe they are not even thinking or not many people are aware of? Well, I believe it's about what we're talking about today. It's about daring to be vulnerable and being transparent and, and talking more and build more closer relationship with our teams. Um, and we need to not only talk about, as I said, the KPIs and target, but also the feelings and so on. Because if we build that team environment, then I'm sure as an overall unit, we will perform better as a, as a, as a team instead of uh, high performing individuals, which is stepping on the toes of others. I love it. Nick, it's been so good. First, I mean, I, let me, I mean, I want to appreciate one, your vulnerability, I mean, your authenticity, but also it's very inspiring the work that you're now doing, helping others. So, I mean, thank you for that. Thank you for being here and just keep, keep going. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. I really valued and appreciate the conversation.